I know we're all eager to learn and very excited about the topic of owls. Um, Eben and Kathleen are our guests today and they live in Northern Itasca County. Eben is an agronomist by trade, um, having provided agron agronomic? agronomic agronomic. I knew that it was inside my brain, but I wasn't ready. Um, support to edible bean farmers. Eben grew up in Duluth and has always been active outdoors and is also a firearm safety instructor. And he began to display the owls to the students as part of the course curriculum on wildlife and conservation. So we are very pleased that these folks were willing to uh, brave the weather and come here today so that we can learn from Eben. Please give him a warm welcome. We'll turn this, this microphone working now. Here she goes. We'll turn it on and see how everything works. Sometimes electronics, electronics can be problematic to say the least. As Lacey said, I have been a firearm safety instructor for the DNR for 40 years now. And one component of that class was wildlife conservation, the animals of Minnesota. So I would start out that part of the program once a year because we taught it once a year with this box, bring it in. I'd have it covered and I'd say to the students, 11, 12, 13 year old kids, I've got something in that box. And if you can guess what it is, you don't have to take the final exam. And they were all, of course, very worried about that final exam, even though we never failed anybody, but it was easy. But uh, I would play a recording and I would say, what I have in this box sounds just like this. Now, I would imagine with a group like this, you have a pretty good idea what it is, but nobody ever guessed it. And I had people saying, kids, guessing everything from a giraffe <laughs> to whatever you can imagine. And I'm still trying to figure out why a giraffe could fit in here, but it was a solid owl. I became interested in owls a long time ago. I've been uh, very active in the environment and conservation issues for a very long time. And I received my first owl in 2001, which was the little sawwit owl. In order to have these owls, I have four owls. Actually, we have five, but we didn't bring one. I have to have a federal permit. I can't just have owls because they're a neat animal to have. I have to have a federal permit, which I applied for. I had had references. And then I have to display these owls periodically through the years for programs just like this for educational purposes. So thank you for the opportunity to show my owls. There are 12 owl species in Minnesota and I need to clarify, I gave this program one time to a group of 4-H students, got all done with it. And one of the students raised his hand and said, I thought there was more than 12 owls in Minnesota. <laughs> So clarifying, there are 12 species of owls in Minnesota. They're not all here at any one time, and they're not all in any one part of the state at any one time. But we do have 12 owl species in Minnesota. Some are much more common than others. But why are we so intrigued with owls? I can go to the window and I have a group of people over and say, hey, there's a strange looking bird out there and nobody will get up or maybe a couple of people. But if I say, hey, there's an owl out there, everybody's interested in owls. They are instantly recognizable. They have those large round heads and they have the flat faces and they have the forward looking eyes. Totally different than most birds that have owls uh, that have eyes on the side of their head. Owls have those forward facing eyes. It's called binocular vision, similar to humans meaning that the line or the sight of vision of each eye overlaps in the center. This allows them to find their prey much easier. So what it all boils down to is that owls probably remind us of ourselves. How many times have we heard people say he or she is a wise old owl? There's a book, a children's book that illustrates that 
very well. Amos McGee misses the bus. Amos is an older fellow, and he's a zookeeper. One day, Amos oversleeps. He misses the bus. He's late for work. But all the animals decide to help him because that's the day that he's going to take them to the beach for a picnic. So all the animals got together. The elephant burrowed a broom and began to tidy up while Amos is taking a nap. The penguin gave friendly reminders not to wake the zookeeper. The rhinoceros made sure all the little creatures were fed. But the owl, the wise old owl, gave instructed, instructed visitors on the importance of animal conservation. So owls are, are smart. Where do owls nest? For the most part, almost always, owls do not build their own nest. They take advantage of somebody else's hard work or a snag or a cavity like we see on the left. These two photographs were taken in Norway, and it's of the great gray owl. On the left, we see an owl using a snag. They also use cavities in trees. And on the right, we're seeing an owl using a stick nest, somebody else's nest. Sometimes they'll use an abandoned nest. Sometimes they'll drive out whoever is in that nest and take it over and uh, get along perfectly well. When we think of tree cavities, we think of owls. And when we think of owls, we think of tree cavities. These two photographs were taken down in southwestern, southeastern Arizona, near the town of Portal, which is a birding paradise. On the left, we see a western screech owl and peeking out of the cavity there. And on the right, am I in the way? Yes, sir. I can move it back a little bit. If we uh, were on kind of a short leash here, but. <laughs> we'll move it over. Is that any better at all? Okay. On the right, we see a great horned owl looking out of that tree cavity. And researchers have actually rated trees based on the number of cavities they have per acre. At the top of the list, the most cavities per acre is the sycamore tree. On the right is the aspen, our quaking aspen, our large tooth aspen. So. I can't overemphasize the importance of cavities, but the problem is we don't have tree ca or cavities in trees until they become older. Fissures are very dependent on old growth trees. This particular white pine is on our properties north of Grand Rapids. I refer to it as a high rise apartment for cavity dwellers. And it's interesting because this tree is in perfect health. There's no dieback in the canopy. There's everything is green but it's getting along, providing all those cavities. This particular tree is about 135 years old right now, and it's in perfect health. So what do owls eat? People always ask, what do owls eat? They eat a wide variety of things, and again, depending on the species, it all depends on uh, the particular species, I should say. But they all eat mice and voles. Some, some owls are almost completely dependent on meadow voles. They eat mice with the longer tail. Voles are active all winter long. They're sexually uh, mature at 20 some days and uh, they are back active under the snow all year long. So that's how, that's why many owls uh, are so dependent out on the voles. They get along very well with that good food supply. But they also eat other things as well. Southern bog lemmings, red squirrels, all of which we have in Minnesota. And they also eat some things that might surprise you. Some of the smaller owls especially will eat moths, beetles. Some of the larger owls will eat snakes and swallow them whole. And one thing that really might surprise you is they eat skunks. Most owls or most birds, I should say, have a very poorly developed sense of smell. Great horned owls love skunks. And without the sense of smell, they can eat that skunk very well and eat one the next day if the opportunity arises. It doesn't seem to bother them at all. I'd like to talk about the 12 species of owls that we have in Minnesota then. Um, I have a photograph of that particular species, a little bit about that particular owl, and then down in the lower right-hand corner with a map from the DNR showing where that particular species lives. So starting out with barn owl. Barn owl is the most common owl in the world, even though it's very rare in Minnesota. It's a mid-sized owl, about 20 inches tall, and it lives in farming areas, as you can see 
on the map here. We do not have many barn owls in Minnesota. We certainly don't have them up here. Unlike most owls, barn owls have dark eyes. Roughly 55 to 60 percent of owls have yellow eyes. 35 percent have yellow or amber, and then some other colors besides. Unfortunately, barn owls uh, population is in decline again because of loss of habitat, as you might guess, and barn owls mate for life. Backing up, moving back up into northeastern Minnesota, then is the boreal owl. This is everybody's favorite owl as far as serious owlers go. If owlers can go out looking for birds or an owl on a field trip, and if they see a boreal owl, it's a great success. It lives in very, very northeastern Minnesota, but it's very rare. It's much more common or much more comfortable in the true boreal forests of Canada. And it's a smaller owl, about the size of a robin. Back to our area again, very, very common owl, barred owl. It gets its name from the barring or the striping on the breast, as you can see here. Very common in most of Minnesota. It's a taller owl, about 20 inches tall, and it too has dark eyes, not the yellow eyes that we see so much of. Similar in size to a great horn, but it doesn't have the ear tufts that we see on the great horned owl. It has a very unique call. I know most of you are familiar with it, but once you hear the owl call, of the, the call of the barred owl, I'm sorry, you will not forget it. I've been hearing these owls lately. They started calling again about a month ago. The barred owl will call it almost year round. I've heard them well into December and then starting up again in late March, early April, mid-March, late February. The Northern Spotted Owl, a little bit off the, uh, off the 12 owls of Minnesota here, but kind of a side note. We do not have Northern Spotted Owls in Minnesota. This is a resident of the temperate rainforest out in Northwestern Oregon, Northwestern Washington, up into British Columbia. It is very, very dependent on old growth forests, and I mean trees 150 years old and more. This is the owl that was causing so much trouble back in the mid 80s with all the jobs versus old growth timber. And it has changed the way the federal government manages 20 million acres of federal forest since then. It is very threatened from loss of habitat, but it is more threatened by the, the introduction or the expanded range of barred owls. Northern spotted owls and barred owls are very similarly, very closely related, the same genus. If you look at a map of the United States, this is the native range of the barred owl. This is the native range of the, of the spotted owl. There's three subspecies of spotted owls, but what is happening is that the barred owl has moved in and migrated in and expanded its range into the, of the spotted owl. So even with all the protections that we've had in place since the 80s, protecting those old growth forests, there's about a third of them compared to what they was 40 years ago. They are critically endangered. The burrowing owl, referred to as the pop can on stilts, it's got that unique look with the long legs. Burrowing owls are found in western Minnesota. They're a smaller owl, about 10 inches tall. It too is threatened from loss of prairies. What have we lost? 98, 97% of our native prairies in Minnesota. There are some reintroduction efforts in Minnesota in the mid 80s, but it met with very limited success. Burrowing owls are the only owl that nests underground in Minnesota. And I keep referring to that loss of habitat, loss of biodiversity. One is just as dependent on the other. When we lose biodiversity, we lose loss of habitat. And we can have all these reintroduction efforts that we want. We can try and introduce burrowing owls, but if we don't have the right habitat, we can reintroduce uh, spotted owls. But if we don't have the right habitat, it's all in vain. And this is just a photograph from Western uh, Oregon. And you can imagine the number of spotted owls that live in that type of habitat with that fur cutting like that. <coughs> Eastern screech owl. There are two types of screech owls in the United States and the U.S. Mostly uh, Eastern screech owl that we have is found in Southern and Central Minnesota. Again, it's a smaller owl. It can be gray and reddish and it has ear tufts like the great horn. And it has a very interesting call, kind of a descending cry.
I've only heard a, a couple of them. Although when we were in Arizona, we did hear the Western speech. The great gray, one of our favorite owls. It is truly an owl of the North Woods. And again, we are at the Southern range of the great gray. It is much more comfortable in that boreal forest again. It's the largest owl in North America. It's the tallest owl in the world. These guys with their excellent hearing can hear a vole under two feet of snow, 100 yards away. They're a large owl, roughly almost three feet tall, and they have a wingspan of almost four to five feet. These guys can really hide in the conifer forest that we have here, but there's one thing that helps spot them when they're trying to hide. It's that white mustache right here. It stands on like a sore thumb every time. Long-eared owl. Again, fairly common in Minnesota. It's about the size of a crow. It's got a short neck. It has the tufts on the top of its head like the great horn does, quite pronounced. And people ask, are those ears? No, those are not ears. The ears are actually on all owls are located right next to the eyes. And the feeling is that those tufts help the animal camouflage. They'll help camouflage the owl, but they also make him look a little more aggressive. When you look at that great horn over there, uh, and you know, I think you'll agree when I show you with the tufts. The northern hawk owl, different than most owls, it kind of leans forward and it, it flies more like a hawk. Seldom seen in Minnesota. As a matter of fact, there are three subspecies of northern hawk owls. It is the least studied bird in the world. One of the few least studied, I should say. It's about 18 inches tall, kind of a mid-sized owl. Hunts during the day, it's diurnal unlike most owls that are active right at sunset or sunrise or are completely nocturnal. And it's found in our northern forests and bogs. It is quite tame. I've been walking, or I've had people tell me that they were walking down trails hunting and had a hawk owl following along behind them, going from tree to tree as they walked down the trail. The northern solid owl, the smallest owl in Minnesota, the smallest owl east of the Mississippi River. It too has the yellow to orangish eyes, and it has a very unique call, as I showed earlier, but it's got such a unique call, the Grateful Dead even included or mentioned them in one of their songs. Once you hear the sound, you won't forget it. That's the male calling, and it will go on like that for hours and hours and hours. And I've had more people, every time I give these presentations, people say, that's what that is. We've been wondering what that was. We thought it was a truck backing up. We thought it was this. We thought of that. No, it's the northern Sawit owl. Short-eared owl, it occurs nearly worldwide. Medium-sized owl, often seen during the, native, during the daytime. It is diurnal, like the hawk owl. And again, it's very dependent on our native prairies. The short-eared owl nests on the ground. And it too is listed as an animal of special concern. And it can be very, very dependent on voles for the food supply. When voles are short, the spotted owl, the short-eared owl will migrate in search of food, search of voles. Everybody's favorite owl, the snowy owl, truly a resident of the Arctic. It can be very common in Minnesota during eruption years, and then other years it's not so common, although every year there's a certain number of snowies that do come down this far. It is very, very dependent on lemmings, but it will also eat voles and mice, rabbits, birds. It's actually been spotted out in oceans catching ducks and other seabirds. But as I say, in the native prairie or in the native habitat, it's 90% 97% of the diet, 95 to 97% of the diet is comprised of, of uh, lemmings. And there's a lot of interesting stories around lemmings. They're a small mouse-like creature, as we see here. I grew up thinking that lemmings commit mass suicide, that they go through these wide population swings, and when there gets to be too many, they jump off cliffs into the ocean and commit mass suicide. That's not true. It is true that they have wild population swings, and in some years when there's so many, they've been known to swim from island to island up in the Arctic, but they do not commit mass suicide. And what happened is in 1955, 56, uh, Walt Disney produced a program or a movie called White Wilderness. 
And they went up to the Arctic, they imported a lot, they paid Inuit children to collect lemmings, brought them back, massed them in, a, in Alberta, and drove them off a cliff into a river. So that's where the, the idea that they commit mass suicide and the, 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 the story lives, still lives on in many cases, but no, it's not quite true. Harry Potter's all was a female, Hedwig. The males tend to be more pure white, the females and the younger ones tend to be more mottled or speckled as we see here. So what is an eruption? Technically speaking, an eruption is a change in the population density of an organism. When speaking of birds, eruptions refer to the movement of northern wintering species to the south. But it can be very complex. And growing up again with lemming, the idea that lemmings jump off cliffs, I was told that all the snowies that come down, I grew up in Duluth, there used to be a lot of snowies, they were all starving. And that is not the case. They found that in most eruption years, 80% of the snowies that come down are very healthy. Although some of the other species, starvation can be a factor. There's four types of owls or four species of owls that are subject to eruption in Minnesota. The boreal, the northern hawk owl, the great gray, and the snowy. How do, bird, how do owls swallow their food? They swallow it whole, they don't chew it. It goes into that first, here we see a, a barn owl eating what looks like a lemming or a, excuse me, a bowl or a mouse. It goes into the first, stub, first compartment. Owls do not have a crop. It goes into the first stomach compartment, is partially digested, and that part that can't be digested is spit out as a pellet. And I think this is probably a couple pellets put together, but the bones and the hair and some of the other material that can't be digested is spit out. The rest of it passes through and is digested. I've got a pellet on display up there too, which I can show you or you can take a look at. So did I mention? Questions that people ask and I sometimes forget to answer or bring up. People always ask, can owls move their head 360 degrees? No, they can actually move them 270 degrees so quickly that it appears like they're moving it around completely, but that's not the case. Owls can't move their eyes. So to compensate for that, they move their head at 270 degrees. What is the population density of owls? And again, it depends on the species. The barred owls that we have so common here are very general feeders. They wade in the water, they can catch fish, they eat crayfish, they eat mice, they eat squirrels. They have a very broad uh, diet. So they can survive, a, a nesting pair can, can survive on about 300 acres, half a square mile. Uh, great horned owls are much more specific. They need several square miles for a mating, mating pair. So again, it's very variable depending on the species and depending on the condition. How many eggs do owls lay? Normally one to five, but the most, in most cases, they lay about three eggs. How long do owls live? Again, depending on the species, the longer or the larger owls, the barred owl, the great horn, the, the snowies live somewhere in that 10 to 13 years. Smaller owls like the sawit are probably closer to seven years in the wild. What enemies do owls have? Loss of habitat, as I mentioned, the great, uh, the barred owl, his worst enemy is the great horn. So owls eat other owls. Uh, loss, of, uh, loss of ice up in the Arctic is affecting the snowies and affecting the lemming population. So there's all kinds of things. Rodenticides are a real issue. Rat poisons are a real issue. They build up in the owl's liver and can survive. Uh, they have a half-life. The rodenticides have a half-life of about almost 300 days or over 300 days, I should say. So that's a threat. When can owlets fly? Most owls fledge five to 10 weeks, but they can't fly for several more weeks. So they are vulnerable at that time. Um, they actually have been known to fall on a nest before they can actually fly. They seem to climb back up, pulling themselves up with their beak and their talons. But uh, there is a period of that two weeks once they fledge before they can fly where they are quite variable. There are further resources. The DNR has been very helpful. I really appreciate all the work and the, the information that they provide. We are very fortunate to have the International Owl Center in Houston, Minnesota. They give timely webinars during the winter time for free. An excellent source of information and I've relied on them very heavily. 
And then finally, the Saks Zim bog. People are always asking me, where can I see owls? I always send them over to Meadowlands, not very far from here. It's an excellent place to see, especially the great grays, the snowies, and the, the boreal. So with that, I'd like to show some of the owls and the other things I have here. This is the barred owl. This is the one that says, who cooks for you, who cooks for you? I should say that I've received all my owls from the DNR. Um, sometimes I can't go out, even though I have a permit, I can't go out and pick them up off the highway. I have to call, technically, I have to call the game warden, the conservation officer. He goes out and picks them up, brings them to me, and then I can take them to the taxidermist from there. And then before I bring, when I bring the, uh, the owl into the taxidermist, I have to show him my permit because he says, Without that permit, the conservation officer will come into him, go through his freezer, and if every owl isn't verified, all the protected species aren't verified, he can lose his license. So this is the barred owl, and again, it gets its uh, name from the barring that we see here. This is the most recent owl that I have. All my owls were mounted by a taxidermist on East Grand Forks, sportsman taxidermy, a guy named Jim Benson that does an excellent job. Um, it too has the brown eyes that you can see here, and this is the guy that's saying, who cooks for you, who cooks for you, almost year-round. The barred owl, as I say, has a very general diet, and he's actually been known to be wading in the water, catching crayfish and catching small fish. The snowy, again, a resident of the true north, the far north, normally above the Arctic Circle. I mentioned that the males, the older males are pure white, and the females and the younger males are speckled, as we see here. It has the yellow eyes, and I'll show here in a minute. Something. Um, actually, I'm gonna show the talons. I wanted to show the difference between the talons from hawks, this is from a red-tailed hawk, and this is from a great horned owl. And you can see what allows the great horned owl to survive here. If you look at those hairs on those feet, um, you can imagine what difficulty a red-tailed hawk would have in our 40 below weather. All owls have four talons, three face forward, and one faces back. It's kind of hard to see this one. Um, but when it catches its prey, it can actually turn one of the talons around backwards to help hold that prey. And owls do almost all their damage. They're tearing apart and eating with their beak and their talons. They latch onto your people's arms, I've even heard. <laughs> and it doesn't feel good, I'll bet. the great horned owl, and you can see where it gets its name from the horns. It appears like there are, people always ask, are those the ears? And as I say, that is not the ears. The owls have ears right next to their, right behind their eyes. And one is a little bit farther ahead than the other, and one's a little bit higher. So the ears are offset. And that's what allows them to see so well and hear so well. The owls that have the better hearing have a more pronounced facial disc. And that disc deflects the sound into the ears. So owls that don't have a, that's good a hearing are more dependent on their eyesight, will not have that pronounced disc. The one with the most pronounced disc is the great or, or the great gray. I mentioned the ears. This is a skull from a great gray owl that we found, obtained. And you can see the size of the eyes relative to the rest of the skull. And the eyes are so large, they actually make up almost 5% of the total weight. Most owls weigh in that five or uh, in that uh, two to three pounds, two to four pounds, I'm sorry. The great gray owl weighs about two and a half pounds. The great horned and the snowy weigh about four pounds. 
very large eyes in comparison to the rest of their body weight. And right behind the eyes, you can see, and I can leave the display up here, you can see the ears. And again, one ear is a little bit higher than the other, a little bit forward than the other, allowing them to hear so well. So the question is, well, let me talk about this here first. A wing from a red-tailed hawk, and you can see how long and pointed it is, versus a wing from a great horned. Owls have shorter wings and more broader wings compared to most other birds. They have a very large wing size in relative to their body weight. That allows them to soar so well without actually flapping their wings. And they have very specialized feathers. The front of the feathers, front of the wing, I'm sorry, breaks up the sound waves. And there are two different very specialized types of feathers in the back. One further breaks up that sound and the third actually absorbs that sound. So with their excellent eyes and their excellent hearing and their silent flight, they really, really are excellent hunters. So the question is, for example, great grays with that excellent hearing, they can hear that bowl 100 yards away under two feet of snow, and they can soar up to that bowl and catch them, dive in two feet in the snow. The question is, why do they have that silent flight? And I think scientists have discussed this for a long time. Do they have silent flight so the bowl doesn't hear them? Or do they have silent flight so that they can hear that vole underneath the snow? Good question. And I think there's a lot of discussion about that. This is the first owl that I received uh, back in 2001. This is the one that I brought in the box and showed the firearm safety kids. And it is the smallest owl that we have in Minnesota. It's not the smallest owl in North America. That would be the elf owl found out other parts of the country, southwestern part of the, in Arizona and that, that country. But this is the smallest owl that we have west of the Mississippi, east of the Mississippi River. It's a very tame owl. When I was a kid growing up in Duluth, I was hunting north of Duluth and had a saw land on the end of my rifle. I have a friend that was hunting out in western Minnesota of an open deer stand. He had one come in and try and land on his head. And he flinched at the last second, and the owl got scared and landed two feet away on the side of his deer stand. So kind of a, almost a tame little guy. A couple of excellent books. Uh, Laura Erickson has a book that was illustrated by Betsy Bowen, 12 Owls of Minnesota. And people ask, how did I become interested in owls? My little book that I received when I was in, uh, what, 12 years old or about eight years old, I should say, the curious little owl that my grandma gave me about an owl that didn't say who, it said why. <laughs> I'd like to open it up for questions in just a minute, but we're on a time schedule here. How are we doing for time? Plenty of time? Okay, good. I'd like to um, show a recording if I could. I can get this to work. That's not what we want to do. And let's see. Yeah. I'm trying to get back to my um, non later. There we go. Thank you. I think so. Okay, I think it'll work here. I wanted to say that I grew up in northeastern Minnesota and I have been around wolves 
all my life from Isle Royale to the Yukon. I lived in Alaska for several years. We lived up out of Grand Portage. Um, and I have been around wolves for a long time. Like I say, and I'm very comfortable around wolves and I find them intriguing and I consider myself very, very fortunate to be around wolves like I am and I have been. But when I am around bar doubles and that rare occasion when I can be out in the woods and have bar, one bar doll up here, one bar up here, one bar doll up here, talking back and forth, fighting over their territory. It is absolutely magical. And this is a, a video from a much lower, younger Laura Erickson, but I think you'll agree that it's I had pretty a lot nice. of phone calls and emails and letters from people who woke up in the middle of the night thinking something terrible was invading their campground when they suddenly were hearing barred animals. They're often doing that because they're hearing another pair or individual barred out on an established territory, and that's when the pair starts really revving up and making those territorial calls. One night, I was being totally quiet, just walking along this road, and in flew two barred owls. There was a full moon behind them, and you could actually see their eyes as they were calling, and it was just magical. <laughs> If there's any questions, I'd be glad to try and answer them. No, I, I apologize. I I encourage people to interrupt me as I go along because everybody's in their cells. Everybody has a story to tell. But because we're on a, I have to be done by what, five for one. I try to have the questions second afterwards because sometimes when I give this presentation for like the 4-H kids or other school kids. These, these presentations last two hours and the kids are still asking questions. So <laughs> especially with kids, it, it's uh, hard to stay on track sometimes. Is there, is there a theory about why barred owls are in danger? The only, the, the question was, is there a theory why barred owls have expanded their range? And the only thing I can figure out is that we plant a lot of trees conifers, spruce, black hill spruce, they call them, in areas that normally would be prairies. But also, I think they may be going north into Canada because they're concerned about the, um, not the sopli, what's the, uh, some of the insects that are damaging the pine, uh, the, the ponderosa pine, and they're migrating through the jack pine into southern, from southern Alberta and British Columbia and Saskatchewan, coming into uh, Minnesota from there. And I'm wondering if that's not where they, where they're, why they're migrating as well. I don't know exactly, but it's an interesting story and I should have mentioned it. Uh, they, they found that because of the biggest threat right now to the spotted owl is that barred owl, even with the habitat protections that we have. And there's a third of them as compared, there, there's a third of them, excuse me, compared to 40 years ago. So they're critically endangered and there's all this controversy surrounding them and what they're, discussing doing, and probably a lot of you have heard this, is bringing in um, people to kill the barred owls, to shoot them. And it's not going to be indiscriminate. They would go through a training program and they would have to be monitored very closely. They've done some, some work on it already and it does seem to be working, but it's very controversial. 
you can imagine how controversial it is killing one species to save another. Yes, it did. Yeah. Um, cormorants, you know, we're, we're killing cormorants because of the damage they can do. So yeah, it, it's very kind and I don't know what, where it sits right now. You said, you said something I didn't know that barn owls fish for uh, in the water. Fish mm -hmm. for, um, they, are they like fish owls in the, in the far not, not like a fish owl. Fish owls almost completely dependent on uh, on fish. Yeah. But the bar, the barred owls have, have such a broad diet that they'll actually wait in the water looking for crayfish or, or frogs. They feel something. They don't see it. They don't hear it. I, I, it's not I, making any noise. Yeah, probably probably feel it. Yeah, but they might see frogs. I don't know when they move. Yeah, it's interesting. That the shell does only that. Yep. Just just sits there and wait for something to come along and feel it. And consequently, the fish owl has very poor sense of uh, of Sight or smell, or um, hearing. I'm sorry. They don't make any noise. They don't. They do make noise. They don't have the software. Just... Yeah. You read that book too. Yeah. This is... <laughs> <laughs> you want to know more? You know <laughs> that was a good, really a good book. Yeah. Is he, is he, he sell at University of Minnesota? I'm not sure. Yeah. I probably got it at Paragus Bookstore though, <laughs> which is my favorite bookstore, by the way. Question. To comment on that from the local account, hard <clears throat> owls and talk to people who had the experience of can tell a water casting on the surface, hard owls swooping out from the shoreline really? after surface goers, and then following them. They tried to leave the owls that actually follow them. On well, they're actually going into the water. They were, they were, they were the three that were just swooping down the grass. Even when they threw minnows out on the surface, Is that right? they would come down and grab them. Oh. Yep. <laughs> yeah, who knows the person? Yes, the this is the great horned owl, and it gets its name from the what appears to be horns or ears, but they're just ear cups. And then the little one on here is the sawwit, northern sawwit. S a w hyphen w h e t. Yes, exactly. Like. Yeah, exactly. That's where it got its name, I believe. Question. Oh, yeah, um, many years ago, the Science Museum in Minnesota had a raptor show, a really extensive. The curators had written up a thing of the soets, but there was, although Especially when they're agitated, they really do sound like an old saw being filed. Um, and that agitation increases. This is the pictures of another male in the city. Um, but this one curator had written on a tag by the saw it that there was some confusion, maybe not confusion is the right word, but in French, the French provinces of Canada, uh, La and there may be some back and forth between La Chouette and Poet. Oh, this yeah. is kind of an interesting observation. Yes, exactly. Uh, I don't have it, but I might be able to find it on the computer. That was the sound of the boreal. I bet I can find it if you. Do you have to leave at one o'clock, or I can I can look for it. Do you have a question? I think I. If you'd be willing. 
We've got a question back here. I've seen owls. We don't. Uh, we don't need the computer. <laughs> <laughs> no, sound a little like snipe drilling. Yeah. You know what that sound is? Except it would be sitting in a tree. The snipe winnowing are going to be moving all around, but it's kind of. A That's really good. Go do it again. <laughs> I was. I'm not as good a whistler. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> I've seen owls a lot of the times in the city, and I've um, heard them a lot of the times up here, living up here, so I like owls. Yeah. I think they're pretty cool creatures. Thanks for coming to Thank this owl appreciation party. <laughs> Thank you. And can I just say some people ask me, uh, um, as I said, I've been an environmentalist. I attended for a long time. I attended uh, Earth Day back in 1969, nine activities, but 1970 maybe. But people ask me why, what's the most relative and relative conservation issue? And I always say, trying to get people to understand why we need owls. Why do we need old growth forests? Why do we need national parks? Why do we need the boundary waters? What does it matter? And so thank you. you go back um, just curious about the, um, the owls that have moved out west, the barred owls. Mm -hmm. um, I read that they're planning, the pro proposed plan is to cull about a half a million of them a over lot. the next 30 years. In your opinion, is there is there another way? Is there any other way than killing all of these beautiful birds? I've tried to hear both sides, but they feel that without those steps, that the northern spotted owl will become extinct. Mm -hmm. And that's just uh, like I say. There's three subspecies: one in up in Oregon and Washington, one in California, and I think there's a third one down in uh, as far south as Arizona. And I don't think they're all that threatened, but. Good question. Yeah, the question is, well, I guess everybody heard it. That's a really good, relevant issue. I don't know. I don't know if you mentioned it, but they do interbreed, right? They do interbreed, yes. It's, of, it's the same genus, yep. Part of loss. Yep. Yep, exactly. So on a slightly different track, but still about owls, owls play heavily with all kinds of cultural mythology. Do you have any favorite stories? I mean, I think a lot of us know the, the thing about, um, I heard the owl call my name, and the mythology with that, especially about, I, I'm going to ask, do you have any just, favorite stories or mythology? Or mythology just off the top of my head, you hear people say it means uh, it's a pre-warning uh, of death in the family. People say somebody's going to die if they see it. All I'm, how about you? Do you have any good stories, or? Um, I don't remember any of them well enough to repeat, repeat them. And I thought if you're reading all the factual things about owls, if you ever come across this, you can use more in the college and go, oh, that's true, oh, that's not. <laughs> they are very important in, that, in those regards. I agree. I can't think of anything except that people associate an owl sighting with death. With, uh, as a, a war death warning or some kind. We will look for an owl mythologist to come speak. Yes. <laughs> I just have to say one of the most magical evenings that we ever had. Uh, the kids were little and we were smelting. And it was a beautiful night, big moon. And we get in the car to go home and this great white owl just came right towards the windshield and flew over us. I mean, it was... It was wow. beautiful. I mean, the the coloring wow. and everything. Wow. Where was that? Where were we smelling? On Highway 1. Okay. Wow. Um, just a couple of observations. I was fishing on uh, Little Long Lake in a canoe, and a friend were in a canoe. We got separated, and we came up, and he said, an owl flew out of there over the water. And being a birder, and he's a non birder, I didn't. <laughs> now I think 
he probably was, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and just one sort uh, I did owl surveys years ago along the Apple Trail, and you know, you're out all night and you hardly hear any, but you hear a few. The coolest thing I ever had though, I had boreal owl calling and then wolves calling at the same time. That was oh, my man. first ever uh, survey result. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah. We gotta get Scott to ask a question. Yeah. Ah. Oh, right. So when I was younger, we saw a lot of owls in the adult world. And now I don't see them much here because I don't go out or what's the population declining for this area? Is it holding steady or oh, owls are declining. Lots of habitat and it's almost always lots of habitat. Lots of prairies. Um, even in Alberta with that the pop can on stilts the burrowing owl. It's very rare in Minnesota, but it was much more common up in Alberta. Now it's endangered. Uh, loss of habitat, more rodenticides, um, loss of prey because of loss of habitat, uh, snowy owls being with warming climate, melting waters, black flies are uh, um, landing in the nest not because it was too cold before. Now the Arctic springs and summers are warmer. Black flies are migrating and feeding right on the owlets. So there's a lot of threats. Lots of us know Steve Wilson, uh, uh, another owler. And years ago, he used to supervise um, surveys of Orioles up on Highway 1 and Highway 2. He was a dog specialist. And when he needed amusement, I guess he, he would say he would hear a saw wet in the distance and he would imitate a saw met a, a male looking for some action, and, uh, and the other saw would, would come in and look through his face, make it known that right. he was a, an intruder. <laughs> <laughs> didn't didn't like that at all. Huh? Uh oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Anything else? Thank you for this opportunity. I've enjoyed it. Thank you.